1943. The German war machine had suffered its first decisive defeat during the Winter Battle of Stalingrad in the previous year. The German army was demoralized, but not defeated. Hitler was confident that a fresh summer offensive would throw the Soviets off balance, dash the worries of the other Axis countries, and do enough damage to shift forces to the inevitable Western Front. Both Stalin and Hitler knew where the imminent summer offensive would take place. During the Stalingrad counterattack, the Soviets had established a bulge around the small town of Kursk that created a threat to the rest of the line in the east. Hitler would want a classic mass encirclement that would crush the Soviet forces in the area. Military planners urged Hitler to begin what is now dubbed Operation Zitadel in April, before the Russians could reinforce the salient around Kursk. But the Fuhrer was determined to wait for his new Panther, Tiger, and Ferdinand tanks to be produced, which he believed would give his offensive more penetrating power, and thus, the offensive was postponed for many months. Meanwhile, Soviet intelligence was already alerted to the upcoming Operation Zitadel, and Premier Stalin ordered the greatest concentration of anti-tank weaponry the world had ever seen into the Kursk salient. The Soviets designed their battle plan around a defense in depth, with six defensive belts in total, each preceding the next. Stalin was intent on crushing the German myth of invincibility. Stalingrad may have proven that the Soviets owned the winter, but the German summer offensives had always triumphed. By the time Hitler allowed the offensive to begin, it had been delayed for three months, and the Soviets had moved in over a million men. 3,300 armored fighting vehicles, 20,000 artillery pieces and mortars, and 3,000 aircraft in and behind the Kursk salient. The Soviets had completed their defenses in depth and even knew the exact locations and time of the German offensive. The Germans would be committing 800,000 infantry, 2,500 tanks and self propelled guns, 10,000 field guns and mortars, and 2,000 aircraft to break through the well dug in Soviets. July 4th, 1943, 2.20 a.m. Soviet artillery lays down a massive artillery barrage the very hour the German offensive is set to begin. German units that had been eagerly awaiting to advance were suddenly thrown into chaos. The Russian headquarters did not receive reports of scattered enemy attacks until 5.30. In the skies over Kursk, the Red Air Force launched a massive air attack against Luftwaffe airfield in an attempt to gain aerial superiority. The greatest one-day air battle in history occurred as thousands of Soviet and German aircraft clashed over the skies of the Kursk salient. The Soviets had failed to destroy the German air power in the region, but they would continue to challenge the Luftwaffe at every stage of the battle on a scale never seen before on the Eastern Front. In the northern facing of the Battle of Kursk, the Germans made initial successes, although suffering high casualties, advancing six miles in the first day and breaking through the first defense belt. But the Soviets reinforced a series of ridges that lay near the village of Ponry. They were the last natural barrier between the German advance and the town of Kursk. General Model poured in all six of his panzer divisions in an attempt to break this Soviet fortress. But after seven days of fighting, the German advance had stalled and the ridge was still firmly in Soviet control. The North had only advanced 12 miles into the Kursk salient. In the South, the Soviet forces of the Varens Front had to spread their anti-tank weaponry up far more than that of Central Front because they did not know exact locations of the German attacks. Central Front had 20 anti-tank guns per mile. Varens had half that. The Germans gained twice as much ground in the south than they did in the north. It almost appeared as they might just create the crucial breakthrough that the Germans desperately needed in order to win the day. The Soviet 5th Guards Tank Army, whom, until this point, had been held in reserve, were ordered to launch a counterattack and force the Germans back as they grew closer to the small town of Kursk. On July 12th, 
the 500 tanks of the 5th Guards Tank Army met the 200 tanks of the 2nd SS Das Reich and the 1st SS Lieberstun Adolf Hitler Division outside the village of Prokoroka. The resulting battle would cost both sides dearly, with the Germans having lost over 80 tanks and the Soviets losing over 200. The Soviets may have lost many more tanks than the Germans, but they had stopped the German southern advance dead in its tracks. The Germans in both the south and the north were still nowhere near the town of Kursk. With both the northern and southern facings of Kursk grinded to a halt, Hitler began to doubt Operation Zitadel. More worrisome, the Allies had landed in Sicily, and reports were coming in that the Italians were not fighting. Hitler, realizing Zitadel had no hope of success, and that the Allies to thrust into the German mainland if Italy fell, cancelled Operation Zitadel and began to draw up plans to shift crack SS divisions from the Eastern Front to Italy to rally pro-fascist Italian army elements that still had a will to fight. But Premier Stalin made sure that the Battle of Kursk was not over. During the pre-planning stages, a counterattack had already been put in place once the Germans had worn themselves down on the Soviet defenses. On July 12th, the Soviet forces launched a massive counterattack in the north that would rout the disorganized German forces and retake the key city of Orel. The southern facing, whom had taken a much greater beating than that of the north face of Kursk, had to take more time to reorganize and regroup. As August arrived, so did the Soviet juggernaut in the south. Just as in the north, the beaten Germans could not hold back the red tide, and the industrial cities of Belgorod and Kharkov were liberated. The territories that the Wehrmacht had battled so hard for in February had all but been retaken by Red Army forces in days. Operation Zitadel, the last German summer offensive, had been utterly shattered in its entirety. The German army had lost key elements of their armored panzer formations, with heavy infantry and tank losses. Another major victory was achieved because, in the words of Joseph Stalin, thus has been exploded the legend that the German summer offensives are always successful and that the Soviet forces are always compelled to retreat. The Soviet army had finally won its first summer battle against the Wehrmacht and sent them reeling. No longer would the Red Army ever have to fear the power of Nazi Germany. The Soviet Union could not be stopped. The German army would be on the defensive for the remainder of the war in the east. The Soviet juggernaut would eventually push the Wehrmacht out of Russia, the Ukraine, Romania, Hungary, Austria, Bulgaria, Poland, and into the fatherland itself. Never again would the Germans ever manage to mount a successful summer offensive. Many modern Eastern Front historians called the Battle of Kursk the Nazi Waterloo. General Ivan Konev described the Battle of Kursk as the swan song of the German panzer. Neither of these descriptions seem inappropriate in that the Soviet army had finally triumphed over the German war machine in the greatest armored conflict of all time. The myth of German invincibility was destroyed, and the war would turn towards the Allies' favor as both the Western Allies and the Soviet Union would push the Wehrmacht forces back into Germany itself, with the accumulation of this effort finally climaxing the Battle of Berlin. The triumph of the Russian army against the Nazi war machine in the East thus should not only be seen as a great victory for Soviet Russia, but for the world as a whole. 